yesterday I discovered that I had a pair of headphones which have a microphone on them. So I'm going to give this a go and see if it improves the quality of my recording. See how we get on. I'm not sure I like it, but um, we'll use it for this vlog entry. <laughs> I feel like maybe I need to get a microphone uh, for this, but do I need to? I don't know. I quite like the amateur, the amateur feel of my recording. Uh, good news, I have resolved the confusion that I had regarding inheritance tax. So I had a, a Zoom chat with my parents the other day. And my dad clearly knows his stuff. Um, and I shouldn't have assumed that he didn't. He knows the value of their house. Um, which I thought that maybe he didn't because they have no reason to revalue their house, but he does know what it's worth. And he said, no, you're completely misunderstanding the situation. The inheritance tax ban for us is a million. And I thought, don't understand that. But it turns out after that conversation, I went away and did a bit more Google research and I basically need to reframe the question. So when I was looking, uh, reading the articles and looking at it initially, those inheritance tax thresholds were for a single person. However, when you are a married couple, it's different. And when I was researching this, a link to a website came up, which I'm going to show you now and just uh, I'll give you a, um, a screenshot of me scrolling down the information. So if you are a married couple, when one or half of that married couple dies, if they gift effectively the entirety of their estate, their half of the estate, to the surviving spouse, that also carries over the inheritance tax threshold and effectively doubles it for the remaining partner. And providing the remaining partner gifts the, uh, the residential home, the place where they live, to children or child or I presume other relative, then that million pounds tax band, inheritance tax band, is accurate. And there's no way on earth that my parents' estate is worth a million quid. So I, that's one less thing to worry about. And I'm pleased about that because, I mean, I don't want anything from their estates until they've, they no longer want it, i.e. when they are no longer around. And I would rather, I had to wait donkey's years for that because I'd rather have my parents around than have the estate. Now, they've discussed with me what they want to happen to their estate when it's, you know, they're not around. So I know potentially what may be coming. I also know the kind of provision that they have put aside to cover possible eventualities. I know that they have put aside money uh, potentially for carers, my parents, I've made it very clear they do not want to go into care homes. And I think provided some awful circumstance doesn't happen, they won't need to. But it might be that we need somebody in to help at home. So they've put aside money to cover things like that. Alterations to the home that mean they get to stay at home, like how to get up and down the stairs when you're in your 90s and you can't walk properly anymore, things like that. Adaptations for the bath, all that stuff. So they've tried to protect themselves for feasible 
realities. And in an ideal world, everyone would be doing this, would be, would be able to do these things. But it isn't possible. And, you know, there was a time when people didn't even bother to leave wills because they had nothing to leave. So anyway, so that's one less thing that I have to worry about now. And now I understand the situation. And it just goes to show you need to be careful when you're researching things on Google because Google doesn't always give you the answer you want to see. It'll tell you what it wants you to see. Never accept the top answer on Google because it's usually the wrong one. <laughs> As I've tried to explain to my mother who reads the first search result on Google and believes it. It's usually the wrong one. Uh, moving on from inheritance tax and on a similar subject, um, a couple of people have accused me of clickbaiting and doom mongering over the state pension situation that I'm just posting for likes and, and subscribers. Um, my channel is my life. It's uh, like a day in the life kind of thing. So it's, um, it's about the things that affect me. It's about my day-to-day -day life. It's about the things I think about, the things that worry me. And I'm almost 50 now, and retirement suddenly seems to be my main obsession. Um, and despite the conversations about the inheritance tax, I cannot presume that I'm going to be okay going forward. So me talking about... The state pension is not clickbait. It's me addressing a situation which concerns me and will probably affect me because I am that generation that are likely to see changes in the, uh, the age of the state pension. And some people have said, well, just stop going on about it. They won't change the state pension. It won't happen. The state pension age has changed before. And... You know, it's, uh, two things here. You've got state pension and NHS. They're two cultural, British cultural institutions that people think will never change. But if you think about what's happening or potentially is going to happen, then they are changing. And it's being done by stealth. So with the state pension, if they raise the age of the state pension... It's going to mean that less people will be eligible for it because you're going to have to live longer to get it. And the problem we have at the moment in terms of the, the financial side of the state pension is that you can liken it to a Ponzi scheme. People don't get, well, people theoretically don't get paid out unless people are paying in. And we now have a lot more people taking out of the state pension than there are people putting in, which means there's basically not enough money to go around and the pensions are being paid out of the state pot. It was supposed to be a system that worked when it was first introduced in 1908. It worked because people didn't live that long. The original state pension age, I think, was 70. 1908, not a lot of people lived to the age of 70. And therefore, only a small number of people would, uh, would be able to claim that. So you just worked and you were, you, the chances are you were going to die while you were still in your working years. So it didn't matter. The state pension went down to age 65. And then what we have is people's life expectancies start to change. So they're living much longer. And what the situation we have now is sometimes where people are, let's say, retiring at 65 and might be living another 20 or 30 years. Not because they're fitter and healthier, but because the, the medical system has changed and keeps people going. So you've got more people retired for longer, but they're sicker. So they're not able to work. And... The problem with extending the state pension age out to, say, 70 or even 75 is that all you're going to end up with is a lot of people who would have hit retirement that can't because the state pension age has been raised, but are too sick to work or just can't find jobs because of the ageism in the workplace. Who wants to employ a 70-year-old? Not many. 
So instead of them hitting the state pension age, they're going to be theoretically eligible for work. But it's going to be like the universal credit system we have now. These people are going to have to go on to benefits. They're going to have to go on to universal credit looking for work. They're going to be on um, sickness pay, uh, uh, EAS, PIP, whatever it is. And they're, so they're still going to be in the benefit system receiving benefits from the state. But because they've pushed up the state pension age, theoretically, they have removed the state pension for a lot of people. So that's almost like a first stage of getting rid of the state pension. The knee-jerk reaction, of course, from a lot of people will be to increase their own provision for state for retirement, which will either enable them to retire at the original age they wanted to, say 65 or whatever, but will also then top up a state pension which is not growing with the rate of inflation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and doesn't cover basic um, living costs because the price of everything's gone up, the state pension doesn't go up comparably. So you then have a system that isn't fit for purpose. So people then have to self-provide. So they will hopefully take out their workplace pensions where they've got them. They will start private pensions. They will maybe have other investments. Like me, they might be lucky enough that their parents um, may leave them something in wills that enables them to top up their retirements. So for the people who can provide for themselves in some way or another, they will. And therefore, that state pension in the short term becomes redundant because they're having to rely on other things unless they want to work till 70 or 75. And I make the similar argument for the NHS. The NHS is a system that is no longer fit for purpose. You have many people on waiting lists who will never get to the top of that list. Many will die waiting to get their operations done or whatever else it need, that needs to be done. So therefore, they are not benefiting from the NHS. And in the same way that people who want to retire will just start to make their own provision, if you have the financial ability to go private and pay for your own health care, you will. Now, I know that the situation with my parents where they've needed operations. My dad needed a hip replacement. He had to have a hernia operation. All my brother's children have needed um, operations that they weren't serious operations, but they were operations that improved their quality of life and were necessary, really necessary. But the NHS waiting list was like, oh, well, you, you, your four-year-old can wait another three years, which they couldn't. And so my parents kind of dig into the savings fund and paid for them to have those things done privately. My sister-in-law needed a serious back operation. My parents paid for that because they can't. So they've already skipped the NHS because they've kind of been forced into the situation but were also able to kind of deal with that. So if you're one of those people like the state pension where you want to retire still at 65 and you're just going to self-fund, which takes you out of the system entirely, the same thing will happen with the NHS. The people who can self-fund will and will not use the NHS. The people who need to use the NHS because they have no other provision at the, the way that the, the waiting lists are going, are probably just going to die waiting, get sicker, get iller, um, ruining their quality of life, whatever they had or would have had if they had been able to get those operations. And therefore, the NHS doesn't exist for them. So in their own way, those systems are kind of being phased out. And I could imagine, you know, the MPs sitting there going, well, if we just let things work themselves out naturally, then these, these systems will stop being of any use. People will stop using them because they're not fit for purpose. And then we can start to reduce them. And I can see them starting at some point where the NHS is concerned. We say, well, if you have an income over X, Y, Z, 
you need to contribute to your medical care or your medical bill or whatever it is because the NHS um, isn't paying for this for nothing. I mean, if you pay to go private, like when my dad had his hip done, he was in within weeks, home in two days, and was walking around like nothing had ever happened in two weeks later. So, but on the NHS, he would have sat there for years, barely able to walk. So, you can see how things are progressing. And imagine what that's going to be like in 20 years, when you still have enormous waiting lists and no NHS service that's fit for purpose. A lot of the people that were waiting for operations, which aren't going to get them, will have gone. With the state pension, if, you're, if, you, if you don't reach your state pension age, and let's say you don't get universal credit benefits, let's say they say you're eligible for work because lots of people who are ill are being told they're eligible for work, but they can't find the work because workplaces are not all inclusive to people with various illnesses both physical and mental, and we have an ageist workplace. And the other problem is that we've got so many young people who apparently aren't in work, why are they going to pick a 70-year-old over a 20-year-old or a 30-year-old? But who knows? We have to wait and see how these, um, these things play out. So none of what I'm talking about is clickbait. These are things that genuinely bother me because... My, in my mind, I was going to just contri keep contributing what I could, which is very small, to a private pension, thinking, right, that's a top up. If I put down that I want to take that from 70, when I was presuming that you would the state pension would come in just before that, um, have an annuity and then just have a small amount each year because that will extend the life of the pension and it means it keeps earning whilst I'm drawing it, have the state pension and keep working. Because the side hustles that I do, well, they're lots of little jobs. I don't even know if they're side hustles anymore because I don't seem to have a main job anymore. Everything I do, which is small incremental amounts, there's only really one job that if I was elderly and not fit enough to work, that I would have to give up, and that's the cleaning work. Everything else I can keep doing. So with that little bit of private pension, with the state pension, which I thought would come at 69, 70, and with my little side hustle still earning, I would have the semblance of, um, of a, perhaps a reasonable retirement for what I'm used to having as a quality of life. Taking out inheritance out of that because you can never predict what's going to happen. So that's updated thoughts, really. Um, yeah. Got one thing off the checklist and then just something else adds to the worry. I'm not going to worry about the state pension situation. I can only do what I do. It's at least now 20 years until I retire. So let's not worry about it. I scrapped the headphones. They're absolute rubbish. The sound is awful. I did um, try to do a little bit of editing in post, but it's hard to uh, tidy up something that was awful to start with, so I'm back to the old setup. I'm going to finish this entry by talking about something that is connected. So it's connected to the whole money thing I've been talking about today. And it's, it's to do with what I do. So things have changed a lot over the last couple of years. Everything was going fine up until COVID came. I always describe myself as self-employed. I run a handmade business making um, clothes, mostly dresses. So handmade fashion designer slow fashion whatever you want to call it and that's been fine and then covid comes along and messes up everything for everybody and 
I became more, I, I carried on, but I diversified. So in order to keep working, because everyone was in lockdown and suddenly had, we had all these new shopping trends. Everyone was online, everyone was shut at home. Crafting became a massive thing. And I just raided my studio and sold all the uh, the things of my trade, so the fabrics, the buttons, the zips, all that sort of thing. I became a haberdashery supplier and that worked really well. And I had a really good 2020. It galvanised me into action, it gave me some new energy, I had something to focus on, I knew that I had to make this work. Um, I'd also joined a mentoring scheme in the May of that year, so after the first lockdown, and that was really helpful because it gave me someone to answer to and someone to bounce ideas off. And coming out of that, when people started coming out again and suddenly crafting wasn't a thing, and I started to diversify with what was left over from that. So I added different things to my uh, to my bow, so to speak. So I started doing the handmade jewellery because um, upcycle and recycle was also a thing. So I started taking broken bits of jewellery, unwanted beads, that sort of thing, stuff that was destined for landfill, and started turning it into handmade jewellery. And then I started upcycling the scraps left over from my dresses into my hand braided coasters, coaster designs, and that's added a really good string to my bow as well. So we expanded out, and that's all thanks to the pandemic because I would probably not have done that and not have had to have needed to have done that otherwise but then of course 2021 kind of loped along and people kind of went back to normal and rebooked weddings happened and dresses were bought and all that sort of thing and then of course 22, 2022 happened and things started to look less certain things didn't go back to normal 2020 was pandemic, 2021 was a bit of a reset, 2022 and everyone thought, oh, everything's going to be back to normal, you know, life will be as it used to be and this will all be a figment of our imaginations, didn't happen. And that's when the economic turn, downturn started to happen. And you could see it coming if you were uh, at certain points in industry you could see the downturn and I started to see it very clearly in my business um, and in my online traffic and in my orders I could see things changing and a lot of us could and then of course you've got big brands closing down you've got Debenhams and all that sort of thing Wilco's has now gone down so many big chains have have disappeared from the high street places that we thought would survive anything and 2022, well, December 2022 was when I started this channel and I wanted that accountability to have something to answer to because I found that that's been really helpful in the past. And I felt that, well, if I stick it on the internet and put it out into the world, I've got to be accountable to everybody. But it has been really helpful and it's been motivating. And of course, now it's turned into an income stream. But 2022 was an odd one massive decline in business you could see it starting to go downhill and that's when I started to look at other income streams now I had some savings that I had been using to prop up shortfalls that started to appear in 2021 and in 2022 by the end of that I thought if I carry on like this I'm going to have no savings and no business at all so I started to diversify I didn't want to go back to the office for all the reasons I have explained in the past. And to be honest with you, it's not a great place to try and find a job at the moment. The work market is still very, very fuzzy. And so I started doing other things like taking the surveys, like cutting back on my budgets harder than I was before, because that way if you reduce your, um, your outgoings and increase your income, you meet in the middle. That is how you do it that's the best way to do it so i started doing the surveys and was doing really well at that cash back apps was helping me cut costs on food things like that um and it just started to get my brain thinking more about side hustles which i hadn't really thought of before that's really a 2022 thing for me and 
so 2022 comes to an end i've just started this channel you can go back and find those original posts they're still up this this whole channel is one long journey and it's really interesting actually looking back at those original posts and seeing how my thought processes are changing and the way i do things as well and of course doing this channel has taught me lots of things i've learned how to do video editing um, i would never have dreamed of recording myself before i'm not even a selfie person so i've had to step out of my comfort zone completely so i've definitely learned new skills lots of new skills by doing this and then of course last year i've expanded on side hustles and still doing the survey still doing the cash back doing the yellow sticker hauls all that sort of thing I've added the medical trials to my side hustles. They don't happen very often, but when they do happen, they're big chunks of money, which make a huge difference to my end of year budget. I only did one trial last year. It was nine days and I made £2,600 from that, which tipped my budget into, um, yes, great, paid for everything this year. Didn't have to dip into savings for the first time in I don't know how many years, five, six years maybe, since I've moved here, I should probably think. So that was really fantastic. Now, throughout all of these different things that I've been doing, I have still been running my business. Because I work from home, because my business runs from my spare bedroom, it costs me almost nothing to run. I now have a uh, my own website through Shopify, so I pay for that. That costs me about... I think it probably costs about £19 a month at the moment because I bought uh, a year on a discount. So that doesn't cost very much. Um, business insurance, which I still have at the moment, which doesn't run out until April, and I'm going to be looking at reviewing that. And then there are the, the things that are associated with a sale. So when I get a sale, there will be fees associated with that, the postage, la di da di da So the business still runs. But last year... 2023, my income dropped by almost half. Which is actually a better projection than I had because I thought it was going to drop by two thirds, but we had a bit of an uptick towards the end of the year. So my business dropped by half and I don't know what's going to happen this year. It's too early to say at the moment. But I keep running the business because it doesn't cost me much to run and because I can do it in between whatever else I'm doing. I mean, before it became a business, I was doing it evening on, evenings and weekends on top of a full-time office job in the city. So it fits in everywhere, and I have lots of stock, so I don't need... I'm not under pressure to create lots of stock. I have plenty on my website. I have a well-populated store. But one of the things I've noticed recently is that my business now isn't my main income earner and it hasn't been probably for about a year but i'm no longer sure what to call myself so for this year my best income stream is going to be the cleaning work now i only do eight and a half hours a week but it's going to be my best income stream but do i want to call myself a cleaner and I don't want to sound like a snob. I probably do to, to someone who is a cleaner and is happy to be a cleaner. But it's not, it's, it's probably about a quarter of my income comes from the cleaning work. So it's not like a massive income stream, but compared to all the others, it is my biggest income stream. And then next based on projections, will be YouTube. So that's something that I never thought was going to happen. Now that I'm monetized, and I'm only three months into being monetized, but if it carries on the way it is, it will be my next best income stream. And I really enjoy it. I really enjoy doing this. I love doing all the editing and the recording. And I don't even need to have to work at the content because... My channel is about my day-to-day -day life, so I just record my day-to-day -day life. And it's simply a case of making sure that it's coherent, makes sense, and is edited to a point where 
um, it kind of comes together on YouTube. And I really enjoy doing that. And it's probably the thing that takes up most of my time as well, because, you know, even editing a 20 minute video can take well over an hour. It depends on how it's been shot. Sometimes, like pieces like this, will just be one long edit and there won't be any additions. But sometimes there'll be lots of small cuts all stuck together. Particularly when like you're doing a like a supermarket shop or you're out for the day and you're recording what you're doing. That can take quite a long time. But I really enjoy it because now I can uh, I can do video editing on a very basic level. I mean, the software I've got is free software um, and it's kind of all bells and whistles. It, it's, it makes your life easy. But I can do that. And a year ago, I couldn't have done that. Even when I started this channel, I couldn't have done that because I wasn't using that software. I was just doing kind of point and shoot and using an app on my, my tiny mobile. So that's now become is now rapidly becoming my my second biggest income stream, but also I think it takes up most of my time. But describing yourself as a content creator, and I don't know how other people feel about it, but when I hear someone call themselves a content creator, my eyes kind of glaze over, and I because I think of people making really over contrived videos on YouTube or being an Instagram influencer and doing sponsored posts and things like that. Um, so I don't really know what to call myself anymore. When I do surveys, I still describe myself as self-employed in um, a handmade business. And if they ask, I'll say I do fashion, apparel, that sort of thing. It's kind of right. And I am registered for self-assessment and everything gets um, paid through the banner of my business because it's all declarable income. So I'm kind of just veering towards just calling myself self-employed. But then, of course, people say, well, what do you actually do? And then say, well, I have a handmade business. Um, I also make YouTube videos. I'm also a cleaner. I also take surveys and do market research. It's a very long-winded way of describing what you do. And maybe that's what people want to hear. Like, wow, you've got all these different income streams, all these different things you do. I know a lot of people call themselves an entrepreneur. I don't even really know what that means. That just sounds like a weird term for just does stuff. So my identity, my identity is changing. My, my, I don't like labels. I'm not into, see, whenever you meet somebody, like at a party or something, or, and one of the first things I'll ask you is, so what do you do? Like, work is the most important thing that anyone can have. Like, it is the defining feature of you is what do you do for a job? And whereas before I would describe myself as running a, a small handmade fashion business, but I have side hustles, it's like everything is now a side hustle because everything's on this kind of equal income band. It's like all these different little income streams are now kind of battling with each other to be the best one. And all going into the same pot. I don't care where the money comes from if it's all going into the same pot. And this year's income, if the projections are right, is going to be better than last year. And last year was better than the year before. So all these things are increasing and improving. And I'm going to end up with a proper income. In fact, I've already reached a proper income because I'm now earning more than I spend. And I have a frugal lifestyle. So back in 2022, I only made £9,000 and had to dip into my savings to a tune of nearly £5,000. And I knew that that had to stop because that was going to land me in serious trouble. Last year, my income was, I think, 14500 and I didn't have to use savings. And this year, I'm expecting it to be better than that. Of course, it's really early in the year and it depends. I might not get any medical um, trials work this year. I might get better medical trials work. I might get small amounts, but those chunks of money are really invaluable to um, boosting income. And it's very early in the year. I, I probably, if I do get any medical work, it's probably not going to be until the summer, 
because last year it was in August uh, and it's still very early in the year I think for them to be that organised. I haven't seen anything coming up yet on the website. Um, not for healthy volunteers anyway. They, they advertise for all different kinds of people and some of their studies are designed around people who already have pre-existing conditions. So the studies that are up at the moment cover those, so that's not me. Um, so I don't know what to call myself anymore, really. I still generally, if people ask, I'll say I have run my own little handmade fashion business because it just answers the question. It's less complicated. But I'm rapidly getting to the point where it's going to be, I make YouTube videos, I'm a content creator. And I don't know how I feel about that as a, as a thing. Because there's this weird kind of stigma around content creators. Oh, you make trashy YouTube videos then. Quick fix, quick get rich schemes. Um, see, whereas when you run a business and you have a, say, a YouTube page on the side so the business also has its own YouTube channel you could say I'm a hammer business I also make YouTube videos to go alongside it it's it's not even that anymore <laughs> so I don't know I don't know what to call myself anymore and no clever jibes in the comments thank you about what I should call myself some of you think you're so hilarious and some of you are just downright rude I think for now I'm just going to stick with oh, I'm self-employed and then if people ask, yeah, I run a handmade business. So I am self-employed. Everything I do goes through self-assessment. I am self-employed. But it's digging into the into the bones of what that actually is. Anyway, so that, that's, that's going to finish today's, today's TED Talk. Um, so we've covered inheritance tax again and for the last time. We're still talking about the state pension. Um, I'm going to have another universal credit video coming up reasonably soon. I have the second of my um, meetings at the job centre with my work coach. I have to go every three months. I have my first one. When was my first one? I signed up in September. I think my first work coach meeting was in December, which went really well. And then here we are in, f in end of February. I will be doing my next one. I've had quite a good month uh, universal credit wise in terms of like today is the day that I have to put my monthly um, figures in. For my claim and I've had a good month earnings wise so thankfully there won't be much coming to me from the UC system this month um, YouTube money's coming in uh, lots of donations from coffee which is great thank you everybody who has been donating towards my content creation because it, it takes a lot of time to make stuff and you're not getting paid you're not getting paid to make YouTube videos. I'm getting paid for the adverts that people are forced to watch after I make the videos. But what I'm making from YouTube doesn't anywhere near cover the hours that it takes. So those of you who are donating via coffee, um, much appreciated. Much appreciated. It makes an enormous difference. It really does. So I've got that. I've had a couple of um, kind of commissions through my business. Um, small amounts of I've got some um, alterations work things like that all makes a difference and the cleaning work I've been doing and the the money from that goes up on the 1st of March which is great they're putting our rates up a little bit it's only 75p an hour but over the course of a year what is that 250 quid something like that So yeah, it's been a it's been a good month. So that'll look good when I go in next week for my UC meeting because they'll see that income and that is my second highest income month since I signed up to UC in September. So they'll look at that and think, oh, aren't you doing well? Anyway, so I'm going to end there and I'll add that video when that thing happens and tell you what happens there. And yeah, so I'm going to end that here.
it's another ramble. I like the rambles, and I think some of you like the rambles. It's a quiet week apart from that, but um, it's nice to get these thoughts out of my head, onto a video, and then I can start thinking about something else. So have a good week, whatever you're, whatever you're doing, whatever day this comes out, I don't know. I schedule all my posts. Someone tried to catch me out the other day and said, well, if you have no internet, how did you get this video up? because I pre-schedule everything. So some of my videos might come out a week or two after I've made them because there are some weeks when I don't have much going on and then there are other weeks when there's just so many things I want to talk about and I try to separate them out. So at the moment I've got about eight videos scheduled which is why I've got stuff coming out every day which isn't... My plan was to have something every other day or every two days but when you've got a lot of stuff to post up and particularly when... They're kind of relevant to things that are going on in the world, so you need to have some kind of chronology around it. And also, if you leave it too long, then what you're talking about becomes irrelevant. And because other posts have then superseded it. So I try to get everything out, which is why there's something coming out every day. But because I post on different subjects, not everybody will watch everything. Because there'll be people who aren't interested in UC. There'll be people who might not be interested in my energy uses this, th this month. So there's a little bit of things for different people and not everybody watches everything, I wouldn't have thought. Um, I know some people do and there are some channels that I follow where I watch absolutely everything. So yeah, so videos are scheduled so by the time this one comes out it'll probably be best part of a week later. But it's still relevant so that's fine and then the post about me going to my Universal Credit meeting, which actually happens on the 26th of February, will come out after the 26th of Feb, depending on what else has happened as well. So that's kind of how it works. You don't have to post something as soon as you record it. And particularly if I'm busy, and if it takes like half a day to edit a video, it's not going to come out the same day anyway. So depending on how relevant something is, like the one about my energy, which I posted, um, that video was scheduled for the... Uh, I think it was 19th of February, um, but I actually made that on the 13th when my electricity bill comes through. So most of what I post doesn't come out on the day, and that's the same for most YouTubers. Most people aren't posting stuff up on the same day because it'd just be impossible. So anyway, so that I hope that explains that. Um, internet outages don't mean no videos, they just mean the video that I've been recording whilst the internet's out because obviously I'm recording on a standalone phone it just means it comes out when the internet goes back up again so it doesn't take much brain sound science to work out how I managed to post videos when my internet was down it's called scheduling it's good stuff good technology we have these days <sighs> I'm gonna go before I get really sarcastic um, have a good week and I'll speak to you soon bye bye